Good morning, my brothers and sisters. We are so glad that you have come to join us as we continue and finalize our study in the Psalms. We are on Psalm 133. Uh, we are getting ready uh, to move into 133 and then go to 134, the 14th and the 15th uh, Psalms, uh, which are the steps of ascent. We praise God again for your presence and greet you with Jesus' joy. We are going to finalize and just make one final statement as we close out the 13th step in 132. Uh, but before we get there, we ask that you would bow with us in prayer. Again, our Father and our God, we come into your presence with thanksgiving and with praise. We thank you, Lord God, for another day's journey in this time and dispensation to live out your will in our lives. We thank you for health and strength. Uh, we thank you for a modicum of the Holy Spirit that resides in us. We praise you, Lord God, because you are God. You are creator, maker, sovereign over all. You are almighty and you will as you will. Uh, we praise you, Lord God, because you have again um, made the sun to shine, the rains to fall, for us to breathe your air and to be in the presence of your saints. We love you, we lift you, and we exalt you. Now, Lord, we ask that you be with us here now in this study so that as we impart to these your children that the word will come to them with not only power, but uh, it will come with, to them with truth, that they might get to know you better, that they might hold you nearer and dearer, and that some man, some woman, some boy or some girl who is hearing this word for the very first time will say, what must I do to be saved? This is our prayer, this is our praise, and we pray this prayer in the matchless name of Jesus, our soon coming King, in his name we pray and for his sake, amen. Turn with me, if you will, as we conclude the Psalm 132. As I read to you, I believe that which uh, will help you have uh, a greater understanding as we conclude uh, the Psalm uh, as it is given to us here. We have spent a great deal of time talking about the Ark of the Covenant and how it has in its embodiment the very presence of God. We even talked to you about how David wanted so much to build the temple so that uh, the ark could reside in the temple. That was his fervent uh, plea uh, to God. While he did not have that opportunity to build the temple, God gave him a promise, and it is in that Davidic covenant, that's what the promise is known as. It was in that uh, Davidic covenant uh, that God said to David, not only uh, I will not allow you to build the temple, but your sons, uh, if they are faithful, and uh, they will be the ones. And he gives that assignment to Solomon, and he also gives him a promise. I want to just read something from you from one of the commentaries that I have been using in our study. It is written by Timothy Keller with uh, Kathy Keller, and the title of it is The Songs of Jesus. Um, in... Um, the Psalm 132, on uh, the latter part, he gives us an assurance. Um, Keller says the emphasis of this psalm is on God's oath, which he cannot fail to keep. God promised that a descendant of David would bring God's presence into the world in a way David could hardly ever imagine. Jesus, the greater David, has indeed come. And he has brought the presence of God into our lives, making us the dwelling place. We are his dwelling place, not because we have worked and earned it, but because we were chosen by grace. You will get no comfort from your salvation if you are not sure 
you have it. God's promise assures us that he will never, ever leave us. I leave you with that as we conclude Psalm 132, the 14th step of ascent, so that uh, you will have this blessed assurance uh, that Jesus is always true to his promises. I certainly hope that you've been blessed by the time we spent. We did spend an inordinate amount of time there, but it was my belief that unless we unfold for you the very essence of, of the ark and the presence of God and how important it was in Old Testament, it is still important to us who live under grace in the New Testament. So let us move, if you will, and we are going to uh, Psalm 133, and we're going to begin that psalm today. Um, this is a wonderful psalm, and I want you to follow along with me as uh, we read it. The, the psalmist says to us, as we are looking at Psalm 133, this is uh, probably one of the shortest psalms uh, in the Bible, uh, but it says to us how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in harmony. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down upon the collar of his robes. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for there the Lord bestows his blessings, even life forevermore. We're now at Psalm uh, 133, the 14th step of ascent. We are going to be concluding between now and the next week uh, our 14, 15 steps of ascent as we go up to Jerusalem for worship. Let us take a minute, break this psalm down, and see what it is that the Lord would have us know as we go through. I want to start with um, a kind of word um, meaning on the word unity. Uh, when, when we think of unity, there's so much there that, the, uh, that God would have us to know that I would like for us to just spend a, a few minutes here talking about unity, knowing what unity actually means, how it unfolds itself uh, in the Word of God. When we look at um, unity, I think it's so important to look at how um, it comes about and, and how the Lord uh, works it into this particular psalm and what the psalmist says and how unity actually works. Take a minute, I gave you some scriptures uh, to read over uh, the week. Uh, if you'll turn uh, to uh, your, uh, the first book, which is Genesis, and let's look at Genesis 13, and I want to look at verse 8, and probably nine. Um, so when we look at verse eight, this is what it says. And, and then I begin to talk to you about why this verse is so important to us. It says, so Abram said to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herders and mine, for we are close relatives. It's not the whole land before you. Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. And if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. I, I want you to understand what is happening here. Uh, Abraham and, and Lot are here. Uh, and they are looking out over uh, the land. They have gotten here at this particular point. And the one thing Abram, and because that's who he is in this particular um at this particular time before his name was changed to Abraham. But Abram um, knows what it is to have close relatives. Close relatives are more than just friends. Close relatives in this instance is bloodline. Uh, 
uh, close relatives, and we're going to talk about uh, the, the, the closeness and relationships that we have, not necessarily as bloodline, but as we come under the authority of God uh, and his son, Jesus the Christ, and how we are related and, and how we are bonded together. Because sometimes we get confused with this Old Testament, well, he's not my brother. No, he's not your brother, but he's your close relative. He says, um, general, uh, uh, one of the things that Abram did not want was any quarreling between them. And, and that's one of the things you have to begin to think about as you look at the word of God. When you are looking at this word, you are looking at it from the perspective of, well, what was the big deal here? Well, the big deal was they were about to part company. And as they were parting company here, um, they, 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 they did not want them to part company with this fighting going on. So if you... Um, Go back to the very first part of the, 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 the verse. Um, Abram went up from Egypt to Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. And Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. So you have the two of them here, all right? So, so these are, are, are relatives very closely knit together. They come up together. Here they are, and they are about to part company. And as they are about to part company, um, the question begins, I'm going one way, you're going another way. So I tell you what, we're not going to argue about who will get what. This is the beauty of uh, what Abram does. Abram uh, allows Lot to choose where he and his tribe will go. So Lot chooses what we consider the best part of the land. See, there's an expanse. And you can see the lush plains of, uh, of, of, of the land right here. And, and Abram allows Lot to choose. And he says, if you choose the lush plains, then I'll go to the mountains. If you choose the mountains, then I'll take the plain. Whatever you don't want, I'll take. Ah, that's a difficult concept. For most of us, because most of us would be at that place where we would be saying, I I'm choosing this and you can take the other. But because Abram did not want to quarrel, he did not want them to part in, uh, in a way that it would cause challenges or trouble. He says, let's stay together. And that becomes the unity that I want you to begin to understand. Because later on, Abraham has to go and, and, and retrieve Lot. You'll know. Uh, you, you know the story of, of Sodom and Gomorrah in this beautiful land that they, that, that Lot settled in. Uh, there was this city, uh, that he had to go into and, and, and get Lot and his wife and, and children to bring them out because that is what the Lord had commanded him to do. Another story for another time. So the first thing I want you to know is that in unity, there is no quarreling. That's the first concept of unity. Not only is there no quarreling, but we are able to, to solve our problems amicably. I think that's the word I want. Without being angry, upset, mad all the time. Um, it's okay to, it's okay to have a word, to, to, to not agree. But it's not okay for us to stay there. So unity gets to be, um, a key word for this, uh, so for this particular chapter as we are walking through. The second thing that I wanted to bring uh, to your attention as it relates to unity, and I gave you the scripture of Romans. If you'll go to the Romans scripture, the 10th chapter, we're going to go from Old Testament to New. I do believe that Bible study should include both of those because if we negate one part of the word, then we're saying that uh, God is partial. He's one sided. He didn't know what it was he wanted to do. I disagree that these two uh, covenants are connected, that the new Old Testament is necessary um, and the New Testament helps us understand better the Old Testament. Uh, so it is important for us to 
keep the two and to use them and learn from them what God would have us to know. Go to Romans 10 and we want to look at verse 9 and we'll go through 21. And I'm just going to read them quickly for you and then I'm going to make a statement that will help you understand how this verse helps us understand even greater New Testament we're now in a more contemporary time, what it is when we talk about unity. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, Romans 10, 9. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved, verse 11. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Had to, had to make this statement. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. Remember, we're in New Testament now. We are now under um, the unction of the authority of God through his son, Jesus, the Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to try to connect all of this for you. Verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 14, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in. And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. This is where the, really the rubber meets the road. For Isaiah says, Old Testament, Lord has believed our message. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word about Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Of course they did. Talking about the Israelites. They, did they hear the word? Yeah, they heard the word. Their voice has gone out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. Again, I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And Isaiah boldly says, I was found by those who did not seek me. I reveal myself to those who did not ask for me. But concerning Israel, he says, all day long, I held out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. <clears throat> a lot of text in there, but let me see if I can bring it home for you. In verse 12, the first thing you want to, to um, rest your eyes on is the fact that in Romans, uh, as Paul is trying to make it clear, he says, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. This was the big discussion um, at the time when Paul is teaching salvation through Jesus Christ. Remember, these are Jews who have grown up under the Old Testament law and they have taken those laws and they have tried to follow them and they have not been successful. But it doesn't matter because they have become so religious that they have forgotten what the laws actually intended. So Paul's trying to help them. You know, Jesus has come. He has been crucified. He has been buried. He's risen. He has ascended to the Father. He is sitting at the right hand making intercession. And Paul's trying to help these Israelites, trying to help these these Jews understand that there is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's another scripture down the road piece. <coughs> but the point I want you to get is he is making it very clear. There's no difference between the Jew 
and the Gentile. In Jesus Christ, we are all related. Remember, we started back with Abraham. We're relatives. We are related how? Because we believe on the name of Jesus and because we were baptized into the fellowship. Jew, Gentile, we're now holding hands as brothers and sisters and walking up the king's highway. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not just because uh, you are so holy over there. Um, it's not because you make the sacrifice. It's not because you bring the pure uh, lamb or the whiter dove. It's not because of any of the sacrifices. One sacrifice is all that is needed and his name is Jesus the Christ. We're in the Advent season where we're celebrating the birth of Jesus. We're celebrating a time when Jesus came into the world over 2,000 years ago and the celebration is a wonderful celebration of his birth but at the same time we're celebrating our release from sin, and it will require his death on the cross. Um, as we continue to look at unity, we're looking at now unity in Christ Jesus. It's, it's transcending just the human amicable, I'm not going to quarrel with you, I'm not going to fight with you, that now it is into a place where it is more spiritual than it has ever been before. Believe in your heart, that's being justified. Confess with your mouth, that's your faith, and thou shalt be saved. That's verse uh, 10 that, that I was just helping you get a greater uh, understanding of as it goes for uh, into this text. As we separate ourselves from the law and we are now under grace. Uh, I love grace. Talked about grace on Sunday morning as we were... Um, opening up December as a time of giving and we talked about grace giving when you get an opportunity go and look at that sermon and listen and find yourself there and be a part of our grace giving campaign because that is the mercy uh, because of the mercy and love that God has shown unto us through his grace and we can do the same for someone else. Uh, when we look and continue, we're talking about unity. We've got to uh, have a great understanding of unity in order to have um, a, a, a reasonable understanding of what it is the Psalter is saying to us in Psalm 133. It is, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren and sisterin to dwell <clears throat> together in unity. Uh, we can have five churches on the same, uh, in the same area within one block of each other. But we can have unity. We can have faith, uh, faith uh, fellowship uh, outreach over here on Fifth Street. We can have the Seventh Day Adventists, our brothers and sisters who celebrate uh, on a different day. Doesn't mean that they don't believe in Jesus. It simply means that they believe still that the Sabbath was a Saturday. We can celebrate with First Park, which is about two blocks away of uh, Baptist Church. We can celebrate with a Mount Olive, which is one block down the road. We can celebrate with a Ruth Fellowship. All of us together are uni united in our celebration because we celebrate Jesus the Christ. That's unity. And that is what the Lord would have us to know. That's what the Psalter was saying as they were getting closer and closer to Jerusalem. My brothers and my sisters, as we get closer and closer to worship, let us not ever forget that we're not at odds with our brothers and our sisters because they go to a different church to fellowship. No, we embrace them because we all believe on the name of Jesus. Let's continue with our, our, our 
our thoughts on unity. I think it is so important. If we don't get unity right in Psalm 133, we cannot be ready for Psalm 134, which is worship. Help me, Holy Ghost. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to John, uh, another New Testament, to the Gospel of John, uh, and we're going to look at John 17. Uh, I love John 17 because this is Jesus himself, and he's praying. Uh, Jesus is praying before um, uh, uh, he gets this opportunity. Um, he says, my hour has come. To glorify your son that your son may glorify you for you granted him authority over all people. So Jesus is here praying for his disciples and we are now a part of that discipling bond, um, discipling um, group. We are part of that discipleship. Look at John 17 and I think I'll just go to verse 20 just so that we uh, will spend our time in uh, a real way looking at what it is the Lord would have us know about uh, unity as it relates to John, uh, as it relates to Jesus and to us <clears throat> in this Grace time. My prayer, he says, this is Jesus. He's praying. He's praying for all of us. My prayer is not for them alone. He's saying, all right, I started out and I was talking about these disciples. Uh, I just want you to know that I'm not just praying for them. Uh, but he says, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. See, the first part of John 17 was all about praying for the disciples so that they would uh, continue the work, that they would spread the good news of the gospel and that in their in so doing, there would be many who would come to be believers. And that's you and I. And for those of you who are still trying to make up your mind, I want to invite you, become a part of this bond, become a part of this group, become a part of um, this church so that we might find not only in Jesus salvation, but in Jesus there's peace, in Jesus there's hope, in Jesus there is so much more. There is a life that allows us to live it without worry. I really do believe that there are a whole lot of things that I could be overly concerned about. There are a lot of things that some of you could be overly concerned about. But when you know who you are in Jesus, you don't get really bent out of shape too far that you mess yourself up so that you cannot stay in this life and serve him. Whatever you need to do, uh, we know that it is because of the power of the Holy Ghost that we are able to do it. Look at John 17, 20, 23, uh, 21 says, uh, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message that all of them may be one. O-N-E. That all of them may be one. Father, he's talking to God. Just as you are in me, I'm in you. May they also be in us. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. Oh, listen to it. This is powerful. I have given them the glory that you gave me. That they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me. So that they may be brought to complete the word there is what? Unity. Unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you loved me. That's profound. I don't know if you quite get it. Uh, I suggest you keep reading it over and over and over and over and over again. And when you get time, read all of John 17. This is a mighty prayer. This is Jesus praying for us. This is Jesus saying, Lord God, Father in heaven, make, make them one. So that no matter what goes on around them, atmospherically, 
what goes on in the places where they live environmentally, that they will always know that you and I are one. And if you and I are one, and they believe on my name as Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the, the anointed one, then they too can be a part of this very same oneness. That is called a complete unity. Had to pause right there just so that we could think about that for a minute. Let's continue with unity. I want you to look at uh, Ephesians 4. Go there. Uh, this is Paul again. Uh, uh, Paul is, is trying to help us understand as, as much as possible uh, what it is, uh, what this unity looks like. Uh, and he keeps adding things on to it. He says to us, first, uh, there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. If they all believe on Jesus, they're now, they're, they're brothers and sisters. Okay, they can go hand in hand first, all right? Uh, and, and that if you believe, then you are now one with Christ. And if you are one with Christ, then you are one with God the Father. The, the, these are the, 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 the uh, building blocks of our faith. But it's also the building blocks of unity in the faith. You know, we, 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 we have a large church and a, a lot of people and, and, and we have differing views. We have different opinions. And it's okay. I may think one way, you may think another, that's okay. But when uh, we get to the table of our Lord and our Savior, as long as we think at that moment, at that space and time, that Jesus is the Christ, that he came to save us from our sin, that he died for our justification and that he died for our justification and that he rose so that we might be all that he is, justified, righteous, holy, that one day we would see him. If we all believe that, then all of the petty stuff that goes on is just that. It's small stuff. I contend by the power of the Holy Spirit. Anything else in life is small stuff. And when we get there in life, we don't stay upset long. We don't stay angry long. We even have um, gotten to a place where we can meet something and say, I'm not getting angry about that because there's nothing I can do. That's something for Jesus to do. And I will rest on the fact that he'll take care of that. That's small stuff. We'll figure it out. We'll do what we need to do over here on earth. We'll do what we need to do humanly. But spiritually, it's really a God thing. If we can ever get there, what a wonderful world this would be. Look at Ephesians 4. Uh, let's look at verses 2 and 3. Be completely humble. Let's go back up. Verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. <laughs> it is amazing that, that Paul uses the language of prison. Uh, Paul understood what prison was all about. Uh, he also understood what slavery was about. And uh, many of us uh, who have ancestral uh, family uh, who came out of slavery, we have an understanding of what it is to be a slave to or a prisoner of. He says, look, as a prisoner for the Lord, that's who I'm a prisoner of now. I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Then he says, verse 2, be completely humble and gentle, patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort. I love this language. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. Paul recognizes we're human. He says, you're not perfect. You're not going to always be humble every time something pops up. You're not always going to be gentle in handling it. You're not always going to have enough patience to forbear. He says, but give the effort. Try it. I've listened to people and and I love the language of love. <coughs> Excuse me. I love the language of love 
Because love says that if you can love someone, then you can certainly forgive them. How do I know that? Because Jesus loves us. And he has forgiven us all of our sins. God loves us. He sent his son to die so that that would be a way out for us. So when, when, when I read this, I'm going, wow, that's love. That is real love. Uh, look at um, uh, verse 14 in the very same chapter. Um, it says, then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of doctrine and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. What does all of that say? To equip his people for work. It goes on and it talks about all of the things that, that the uh, body of Christ is about until we all reach unity, verse 13, in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Somebody asked me once, why do you even bother to teach a Bible study? Uh, what, 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 what's so important about it? Because in my life, I accepted the calling to teach and preach. I accepted this role. And because I did, my job is to teach and preach all that is necessary for the body of Christ to come to unity. That's really all I do. At the end of the day, if I'm not preaching or teaching a message of our coming together, I missed it somewhere. I don't want to divide us. Uh, we can do that all by ourselves in our humanness. I want us to come together around that which is most important in life. And sometimes it may be um, that we are at odds on political realms. And that's okay. But it's not okay for us to be at odds on a spiritual realm when we are talking and believing in the same God. So unity is a key here for us. Um, when we look at the word of God, um, when we are going through th this Ephesians 4 chapter, um, and, and maybe I should spend a little bit more time here. Uh, and it could help somebody. Um, it talks about in verse four, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. He says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and father of all. See all of the ones that are in there who is over all and through all and in all. I'm at verse seven now. Ephesians 4, 7. <clears throat> but to each one of us, grace, grace, I love it. To each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascend it mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended in order to fill the whole universe. He went down into the bowels of the earth and then he ascended into the heavens above the earth. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service. That's a part of our mission to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That's really what it's about. I'm teaching to help you understand what your role is in the body of Christ. Help me, Holy Ghost. 13, until we all reach, so that we may all be built up and until we all reach unity, 13, in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, help me, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Maturity brings about unity. People who are mature, and I, I'm so glad that I, I, I had to use that word. Those of us who are mature, we don't quarrel like children. You know, children are, are, are they, they, they are young and totally inexperienced. And all they know is what they feel at the moment. 
And the feelings come out. And the feelings will come out any kind of way they come out. Because remember, they're children. And, and because they're children, um, we really give them, quote unquote, a pass. And I try to teach this to teachers a great deal. I say, they're kids. Don't forget. I don't care if he's got a little bad mouth. He's only seven years old. He's immature. He doesn't even understand half the words he's using and their meanings, connotation, or where they have come from. Will you please be mature and say, come here, baby. That language is not appropriate in my presence. Now, if you want to use it somewhere else, I can't stop you. But in here, this is not appropriate. We've got to talk to children and recognize their children. But when we get to be adults... There has to be some level of maturity, learning, experience, teaching that we have ingested in order to grow and hopefully, prayerfully, we are growing up in Christ. Help me. Then we will no longer be infants. 14, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of doctrine and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. Instead, this is who we will be. Listen, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head and that is Christ. From him, Christ, Jesus, the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament. I love the language. It's talking about how the body is fitted together, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. I, I want to leave you with this whole thought of unity so that as we continue, you will have an understanding of what it means to dwell together in unity. It is like the sacred oil used in the consecration of the priest. That's what, that, that, that's what the verse says. It is like the precious oil upon the head of running down and upon the beard, upon the beard of Aaron. Guess where I am? I'm back in the Psalms. Psalm 133, running down on the collar of his robe. So you have to understand that they were sharing with us a likeness of unity coming from the anointing of the priest. Help me, Father. Sacred oil poured on his head, it goes down and it goes through his beard. Beards were important to the Israelites at that time. As a matter of fact, I think they're so important to us at this time. I've never seen more men with beards in, in the last year than in my entire life. So, so the beard, it goes down from the head, the anointing, through the beard, all the way on to the collar of the robe of the priesthood. Aaron, he says like Aaron, Aaron was the founder of the hereditary priesthood, the original uh, bloodline out of which all of the priests came, deposited in the ark, his rod. That's how important the priesthood is. Aaron's rod was in the ark. That means that because it was in the ark, it was sacred. Those are the kinds of things we have to remember as we are looking at unity. Unity in the church is about honoring the pastor. Unity in the church is about honoring the priesthood. Unity in the church about giving honor and respect, which is also a return. Not only does the priesthood get it, but the priesthood gives it back. Aaron's beard, greatly important. It all spreads from the head, the beard, the robe. And what we get here is that we are looking at the good will and how it can be confined. The good will of men. Good will, good will. Isn't that a part of the message of Jesus the Christ? Goodwill. Then he says, listen, then he says, it is like, uh, not only is it like the precious oil uh, upon the head running down on the beard. We're back at the psalm again. Then it says in verse 3, 
It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountain of Zion. For there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. The dew of Hermon, coming out of nature, maintaining high peaks and rain, and then coming down into Zion, a moisture proceeded. All these things coming together, what a blessedness of unity, which is also joy. What do we need today? <laughs> we need unity. Let me just share with you again from my friend Timothy Keller uh, so that you can have, uh, we, I will leave you with this note. It says the unity of God's people brings opposites together. See, I like that. I contend some of the best marriages are with those uh, of us who are, are married to someone who is totally unlike us. Uh, because you can really test your unity when you are, when you are married to someone, you are uh, uh, joined to someone who is not just like you. Because if that can't be unity, if you can't find unity in that union, I don't know how we could ever make it in real life. Because we don't walk around with people who all sing kumbaya and join hands and uh, they are together all the time. We are always in the presence of those who have a differing view. And it's okay. It's how we respond. Listen, the unity of God's people brings opposites together. Symbolized by tall Hermon in the rural north and the little hill of Zion in the urban south. That's how they bring this together. For Hermon's dew to fall on Zion would be a miracle. And so is the supernatural bond that brings people far divergent in culture, divergent in race, divergent in class, how they all come together in the Lord. Now, isn't that the church? The unity and love he gives us is like precious oil in ancient times, making people fragrant and attractive to us who otherwise we would dismiss or reject. So my brothers and my sisters, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. I must go, but I do want you to know that if Psalm 133, step 14, is not resonating with you in your spirit and making you think very deeply about what role you play in unity, then I've missed my mark. But I will come back next week as we talk about how we move from step 14, unity, together, one mind, one body, one spirit, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, how we move up to worship. Praise God for your presence again. Please join us for our noonday prayer. Our prayer will be on at 12 <clears throat> and we will be praying and asking God to continue to bless us, to bless the Shiloh Baptist Church in Plainfield, New Jersey, as we are seeking our next senior pastor. Grace and peace.